Good afternoon and welcome to the University of Manitoba Alumni and Friends Virtual Learning for Life series. My name is Tracy Bowman. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations at the University of Manitoba and a proud alumna. Before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in, this, in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thank you to all of you for joining us and making this event part of your day. This is the fourth Virtual Learning for Life series that we have been able to offer University of Manitoba alumni and friends around the world since the start of the global pandemic. And we've seen great interest in this program and are so glad that you are joining us, whether this is your first lecture or the 26th that you've heard. All previous lectures live on our website, so you're able to go onto the alumni section of the website and you're able to see all of the past Virtual Learning for Life uh, sessions if you go onto that tab. So please do that. Please uh, return to those lectures. Please share with family and friends. There are some wonderful presenters who've been part of this program over the last year. We are able to offer this program free to all of our alumni and friends thanks to the very generous sponsorship of our affinity partner, IA Financial Group. Many thanks to them. You can learn more about their insurance options that they offer UM alumni also on our UM website. So before I introduce today's speaker, just a few housekeeping details. All of you are watching this on YouTube. And uh, as I said, those sessions are recorded and they will be put on our website. Our format today is I'm giving a brief introduction and that our speaker will present for about 40 minutes. And then we will open up now, the only way that we're able to, this is your first time here in Virtual Learning for Life, the only way that we're able to monitor the questions is we go to a pl platform called slido.com. So that's slido.com and the password is VLFL12 or the code that you can use. And once you enter that, you're able to freely ask any questions that you like. We've already started to see some comments and questions come in. I welcome you to do that throughout the presentation and as I mentioned, we'll try to get through as many questions as we can before the end, uh, before we come to 2 p.m. So now I'm delighted to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Negan Sinclair, who will be speaking on where reconciliation lives. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Sinclair before we, uh, before he presents. Dr. Sin Sinclair is Anishinaabe from St. Peter's and Little, Little Pegway, uh, Peguas, and is an assistant professor at the University of Manitoba. He is a regular media commentator on CTV, CBC, APTN, and the Winnipeg Free Press, uh, and he has a weekly opinion piece in the, weekly, in the Winnipeg Free Press. He is a graduate of the University of Winnipeg, University of Oklahoma and the University, University of British Columbia. He is, his written work can be found in the pages of the Exile edition of Native Fiction and Drama and, news, and newspapers like The Guardian and online with CBC Books, Canada Writes. Now with that, over to you, Nigan. I think you're mute. Look at this. <laughs> Oh. I finally, I, she actually came over just as you were introducing me. And here's oh. Nibby. <laughs> Sorry, Nibby? Nibby, that's my, uh, Nibby. my partner in crime. Uh, uh, she and my daughter. Anyway, so bonjour, Dewey Magadaduk, Nigan Webinum, Nidish Nakas, Namagoshin, Dodem, Nimen Wendam, Oh My Ayan. Kanabach, Bangi, Ziguan Agwajing, Bonjour, Nimesho Masak, Nako Masak, Mishani Kijik, Nibi, Niji, Nibikwe, Bonjour, um, you know, all of my relatives, and I just want to acknowledge uh, the, the passing of the, the really remarkable Ted Fontaine and and that we we're all kind of walking in the footsteps of this incredible uncle of ours. And, and uh, yeah, I just uh, want to send our, our great love and our appreciation for Ted's life and send it all to his family. Bungi Pangus and Donji, Anishinaabe and Dao. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to, sh to share with you the language of the territory. Um, so my name is Negan Sinclair, and I'm coming to you uh, from my home in uh, Manitowoble, Winnipeg, this beautiful place that we uh, we call our home. I'm, uh, you know, I've never not been here. My family's never not been in this place. We've always been from here. And so uh, my Anishinaabe side comes from Peguis First Nation, but previously to that, Bawating, which is Sault Ste. Marie. 
And then my Cree side comes from Norway House Cree Nation, which is where my grandmother comes from, or sorry, my grandfather comes from, my grandmother comes from Manicatogan, which then settled in uh, Pegasus First Nation, St. Peter's. And then Norway House is where my uh, great grandfather comes from through the Mackay line. And so, uh, you know, and of course we've adopted many people along the way. So I've got uh, wonderful French relatives with my Gamash family relations. And of course with my, uh, um, British relations through the Warren line, which comes from Regina all the way back to Britain. And uh, <laughs> I like to say that I cover the full bingo card of Manitoba. You know, like I've got it all. I've got Anishinaabe Cree, British French. I've got a Scottish name uh, because my grandfather enfranchised to go fight in World War II. Uh, we lost our status. And so for many years, my father worked for the Manitoba Métis Federation. And so for many years, uh, in fact, my middle name is Riel. So we, uh, we're certainly not Métis, but we have deep affiliations with the Métis nation. And uh, so like, what, have, what am I missing? You know, <laughs> Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, Inuit, Dene, you know, and of course all the other nations that have come to this place. But, you know, I'm very much a product of this place. I'm very proud of where I come from. I'm very proud of this place. And I love this place very much. As you know, I've done many different things in my in my travels. Uh, I write a column for the Winnipeg Free Press. And I, of course, I uh, wrote the... Um, are created with Warren Carey, the first Indigenous anthology of Manitoba history. Um, and so, yeah, miigwech and thanks for having me to my colleagues at the University of Manitoba. Uh, I've, of course, recognized and acknowledged the territory in which we live. And so, um, you know, miigwech for having me. I want to talk a little bit, though, at the beginning about where it is that we are and this place right here and what today is. It's a very special day today because it's the anniversary of the Manitoba Act in which uh, the only Indigenous-led province in Can Canadian history uh, entered Confederation. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. So uh, because this is a new platform, I'm going to just sort of get myself organized. I'm assuming that Teddy's going to let me know if I do anything wrong here. Um, there we go. And uh, I'm assuming that I'm all up and ready to go here. So uh, please just stop me if there's anything wrong with that. But uh, here we go. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this place. Um, this is what I do. You know, the different things that uh, when you're an Indigenous professional in this environment, an Indigenous uh, person, an Indigenous uh, brother, sister, cousin, nephew, uh, you have a lot of expectations on your life. You, you have to be able to do a lot of different things. And so, for example, um, this is when I was at the, this middle top of the slide here was when I was at the World Court uh, talking about the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And then that same week, here I was talking in Nietzsche Commons, of course, no longer uh, operating as a restaurant, as a, as a grocery store, but it's now uh, inhabited by Scope, which is a mental health facility for people who are living on the streets and transitioning into employment. Uh, you know, but that was that same week. I was at the United Nations one week on a Monday, and then on a Friday, I was talking to people in the streets from Nietzsche Commons in the neighborhood, talking about poverty and talking about how do we find the next meal and what do we do with homelessness? Like that's the kind of work that you have to do as an Indigenous professional. You have to be able to think in the macro, the very big scale, but you have to be able to think in the minor and, and, and or the micro, as it were, you know, the everyday life material existence. I mean, both of those things you have to be competent on. You have to be, remember probably the most important thing of all, which is that you are a nephew and a son and a brother. Um, as much as you are off with a PhD or like how I like to say is when I went and got my PhD, I thought it was pretty hot stuff. In fact, this was my graduating class, bottom left-hand corner of this picture. Um, but uh, when I went to my auntie's house and I said, hey, auntie, look, I'm Dr. Sinclair. And she handed me an ax and said, go chop me some wood there, Dr. Sinclair. <laughs> and so that's what it means to be an Indigenous professional. You don't stop being a relative because you go off and get, you know, a house or a bunch of letters behind your name or you know a nice job you are always a nephew and you are always a brother and you're always a parent that is what it means to be an indigenous professional within society today and so i think people forget that and i think people uh, in the non-indigenous world often like to divide these things up and think oh well i'm this in this way and i'm this in this other way but for an indigenous person you are expected to be the same as everybody else feed the elders first, take care of your community first, 
and probably most of all is just never forget where you come from. Always go back to your community. Make sure that you go and you uh, advocate for people when you're out there in the world and you're talking about your relatives because it's how you bring along the community, not that you leave it. That's the job of what being an Indigenous professional is all about. You know, when we talk about territorial acknowledgements, and I appreciate that one was made today, um, I want you all just to think about the territories in which you live and you work and wherever you are in Turtle Island or North America, wherever you're sitting right now and hearing this talk from, we all have relationships, we all have responsibilities. It's like being in a, uh, in a roommate relationship or a spousal relationship or a familial relationship. We all have responsibilities to each other. We don't just do that once. Like, can you imagine if you're with your spouse and you're like, I don't feel like doing the dishes. I did that once. Why can't you be happy with that? And that's pretty much how non-Indigenous feel, peoples feel about Indigenous peoples. They'll say things like, oh, why do we got to honor these treaty rights? Or why do we got to keep talking about sharing the land? Or why do we got to do these things like territorial acknowledgement? Well, it's because we have responsibilities to each other. And if one side doesn't maintain the responsibility to another, then why would Canadians continue to be inhabiting Indigenous territories? Why would they even have a legal right to do so? In fact, that way, if they don't fulfill the responsibilities every year, every moment, every opportunity, then the treaties in many ways, the foundational documents of the country uh, can easily be deemed as null and void by the participants in that treaty. And then we've got a real problem on our hands. What are the ways, the legal relationships that we have within this space? These are really important things to speak about because when we make a territorial acknowledgement, we do two things. One is we see the people we have been conditioned not to see we've been taught not to see, we've erased from the map. I'm going to show you what that looks like in just a minute. But then second is that we, we commit to acting differently. That means we have to deal with the issue of poverty, overwhelmingly an Indigenous issue here in Manitoba. Uh, we have to deal with the issue of murder, missing Indigenous women and girls, which is overwhelmingly the disproportionately violence in Indigenous communities. We have to deal with the issue of stolen land that 99% of Manitoba is stolen and that we have to figure out a way to share this beautiful opportunity together. And the Cap Young Barracks, for example, on Route 90, that's just like a drop in the bucket. Like we haven't even started to fill the bucket yet in terms of sharing the land. Cap Young Barracks is like half of a drop in a very big bucket. And so, you know, when we talk about territorial acknowledgements, it brings us to a real important kind of moment of conversation. Um, <clears throat> I want us to think about this place, you know, this where we're sitting right now. There's a reason why certain things happen in this place that happen nowhere else, period, that do not happen anywhere in this other than Winnipeg, Manitowabo, this place we are sitting on or I'm sitting in right now. I want you to watch this short video just for a little, I'm gonna watch two different clips of it. So let's watch the first one. That's the first clip. Great. So uh, I want you to notice two things in this clip. The first is that notice that these are Indigenous peoples who are coming to a public space uh, not a private space, even though we like to think of malls as private spaces. Uh, for example, try to go to a mall and not buy anything or loiter. Uh, but 
Notice how indigenous peoples are creating public space or reminding us that underneath the concrete is a place of gathering, is a place of community, and most important, a place of celebration. Notice how everyone's having fun. Notice that no one is buying a thing. Second thing, uh, this is a, a moment in which Indigenous peoples are asking the country to have a conversation. And at the time it was I Don't Know More, which was um, predominantly Indigenous-led movement uh, by young people to talk about the new government bills proposed by Stephen Harper's government, which are all still here, by the way. Those are all still, uh, Justin Trudeau has not removed those bills. Um, those bills are still here that enable the, uh, the government to ignore water protections, to simply take Indigenous lands by a majority vote on whatever day they, day they declare a vote. And then for the most part to hammer through projects like pipelines or resource development initiatives without the consent, uh, the full consultation with Indigenous peoples. But notice how there's many reasons to be angry, but what are Indigenous peoples doing? They're going to a mall inviting people to dance. And I want just to think a little bit about that, of why did Idle No More or these round dances in public spaces or this public display of community, collaboration and love take place right here in Winnipeg, right here on Treaty 1? Like, why is that? Why is that the case? Um, you know, this place is made from tobacco. You know, that we we are a community that's built on the premises of tobacco. Let me explain what I mean. Tobacco is the most important language of Indigenous peoples in this territory. Uh, not all territories, but in this territory particularly. If you want to open up a gathering, if you want to ask someone to do something, if you want to offer a gift, you offer tobacco, a sema. Um, I'm not going to give you a big tobacco teaching at this point to be able to understand what are the ins and outs of tobacco because there's hundreds of them. But what I can tell you is that tobacco represents time. It represents the, the blood, sweat, and tears that you put into tobacco. Um, so, for example, um, well, you can't really see it right now on my phone, but but if you if you already get a chance to see on my Facebook page, uh, I've posted the uh, the tobacco seeds that are being planted by the Manitoba Indigenous Cultural Research Center. My my um, my my sister is uh, involved in that tobacco growing project. Tobacco takes a lot of time, which is why you put your blood, your sweat, your tears into tobacco. So I want you just to imagine you put a hundred hours into something over this long process, and then you just give it away. How much would you respect that person? How much do you are you showing care and consideration of that person? And probably most of all is that when you offer something worth a hundred hours, and you you offer it in such a way that it is being offered with respect and gratitude and, and acknowledgement, then you are also expecting that to be returned because we all human beings expect reciprocal gifts. There's no such thing as a gift without strings. Every person, like a handshake, expects that hand to be reciprocated, expects that hand to be offering the same gifts that you were offered back. So if someone offers you a gift for 100 hours, you're being asked to put a lot of time and investment into that relationship as well. Oh, and by the way, that's the story of Manitoba. Uh, the original Treaty of Selkirk uh, and Peguis, which was in 1817, was an agreement between two sides led by leaders, Peguis on one side leading uh, Anishinaabe and Cree and in many ways Assiniboine leaders at the time, uh, Lakota leaders at the time, and then Selkirk, who was leading the major predominant settlers, predominantly from the Hudson Bay Company. Um, also the Northwest Company as well, which was not quite affiliated with Selkirk, but were certainly a part of the negotiations. Um, now this particular Selkirk Treaty in 1817 forged the first legal document to allow non-Indigenous presence in Manitoba. And as you can see here on the dots on the map, you can see how where where non-Indigenous peoples were assigned to live. Uh, this is the basis for Manitoba. Without this treaty, there is no Manitoba. Non-Indigenous peoples are not welcome here. They are not adopted. And probably the most important thing of all, if you look to see on the map, you'll see that in the Indigenous signatures are the clan signatures. And the clan signatures represent not just Indigenous people's identity, because we're talking about our familial relations, it's kind of like signing your name, right? Sinclair represent a whole series of Sinclairs. When you're signing your clan relative, you're signing involving your family, but you're also signing involving your commitments to the land. What you're saying is, is that as the bears, as the fish, as the martins, as the snakes have adopted me, which is what the signatures are, those, those, all those five animals, um, we too will adopt you. Therefore, we are part of a familial network. And that means that you've not just been adopted by Indigenous peoples, you've also been adopted by the animals, 
the earth in which they live, the air in which they breathe, going all the way back to the first moment of creation. It's like a connective set of tissues, you know, a, a connective tissue that then creates a familial network in a relationship. So for example, when the city of Winnipeg dumps sewage into the Red River system, it is a direct treaty violation based on the Selkirk Treaty of 1817, because what it does is it is dumping and impacting the fish relatives that we have signed treaties with. We have guaranteed to the fish, according to the Selkirk Treaty, the original document that creates non-Indigenous presence here in Manitoba, we have said that we will commit to, to sharing territories with you fish bears, marten, snakes. But so then when we dump sewage into the Red River system, it is a treaty violation. We should literally be charged with a crime based on violating the very premises and laws which make Canada what it is. Now, of course, uh, the Hudson Bay Company, upon claiming this territory later, uh, ignored this treaty outright. Like many Canadian institutions, just simply flagrantly ignored Canadian, the basis for Canada, the basis for Indigenous law and relationships for people to enter into territories, just flagrantly ignored it. Just like Selkirk, you know, Selkirk's very first promise to Chief Pegwis. Pegwis said, you may live here, you may live along the river. And notice that Pegwis gave Selkirk the greatest place to live, which was by the river. You know, if you want to guarantee success, of someone who comes to your house, someone who's going to have a good experience. You put them in the guest room, you give them the nice sheets, you don't give them moldy food to eat, you give them nice food to eat. You don't make them sleep in the garage, you make them sleep in a nice bed. Pegwis was doing that for Selkirk, he was putting Selkirk at the rivers, guaranteeing their success. But he wasn't saying, I never want to wash again, or I never want to use the rivers again, or I never want to, uh, you know, go and fish again. Like that's absolutely preposterous and that's a very non-native way of thinking. Like I get the land, can't come on my land anymore. Pegasus was saying, we all share the river lots. We're all going to share the river, but you can live by the river because frankly, you need the most help. <laughs> and, you know, the evidence of that was Selkirk, when he first showed up here with the settlers, they showed up in October. Like who comes to Manitoba in October? Someone who's like, not aware of this like minus 50 degrees here so like don't think you're going to build a house in a month so like Pegasus knew that selkirk was very fragile could not support himself needed a whole lot of help in order to live in this place so what he did set him up by the rivers make sure that the success is possible make sure the children could live i mean Pegasus was incredibly generous but what he said was in order for that gift to be reciprocated you must offer me 500 pounds of tobacco one pound 100 pounds for every liter and Pegasus was not expecting Selkirk to, you know, to uh, to blood, sweat, and tears, but he was expecting him to show the parameters and the commitment of the relationship, meaning that he wanted Selkirk to show that he cared. And he said to Selkirk, you must do that every year. Every year, from the growth and the produce and the tobacco that you grow, you must bring those gifts to us so that we can share that together. Not that we'll take 99% of it or that you'll take 99% of the land, but that we will share it 50-50. We will share everything together, just like we've shared the territory with you, just like the bears have shared the territory with us. The air shares its bountiful gifts with us. We don't own the land. If anything, the land owns us. Uh, we live in cooperation with everything around us. And you too, non-Indigenous peoples, Lord Selkirk and all of your descendants, you can enjoy this incredible bounty and beauty of this place. Selkirk, unfortunately, for one reason or another, only gave tobacco once. Like a used car sale. Purchased, thought of it as a land purchase and said, oh, well, I never have to do this again. Kind of like if you turned to your spouse and said, uh, I'm only going to do the dishes once because that's, you know, why are you, why do you need me to keep doing it? Like, why do you need me to keep doing these? Like, why, why do you complain and protest all the time? Why are you so upset? I did it once. Why aren't you happy with that? Like, that's the whole issue of what's been led to this moment. Now, today is the uh, anniversary of the Manitoba Act, uh, where the Métis led this community uh, into confederation. And they did that on the guarantee that Métis would receive land plots, uh, recognized land plots by the federal government in order for Manitoba to enter confederation. And this is a beautiful day for many different reasons, one of which in which uh, if you get to read my colleague Tom Broadbeck's column today, uh, it's a really great piece on the kind of drama, the thrilling drama that it took to get Manitoba and confederation because Canada really treated Manitoba as a terrorist state. 
and in many ways arrested the negotiators when they came uh, east, uh, treated them badly, and then you know through the fierce belief of love by the Métis leadership, as alongside the Anglophone and British and, and even some Americans, uh, we entered into this place with love and kindness and generosity. Why do you think, or who do you think taught Manitobans about that kindness, generosity, and commitment to one another, even though the East, led by Sir John A. Macdonald, arrested the negotiators the second they arrived, but yet Manitoba believed fiercely in this sort of position of negotiation that reconciliation was possible. Like, who do you think taught them that? Let's get back to that in just a minute here. I want us to look at the, where, the world in which we live right now. This is the world in which we live. Now, you might say to yourself, well, that's not the map that I was taught growing up. or Like, that's an Indigenous map, right? So if we look to see, we say, you know, what has been this place for, if North America is, let's say, a 500-page textbook, right? Uh, non-Indigenous peoples would have arrived on, like, page 498. The 498 pages before non-Indigenous arrival is this dynamic encyclopedia, series of encyclopedias, entire internet and a half of history, experience, knowledge, stories. And if we look to see all the different Indigenous nations, we have this vast, incredible complexity. Like, we don't even need the United Nations. We got it right here. Like, Manitoba alone, eight different Indigenous nations all somehow interconnected, multiple different languages, multiple different ways people imagine life is and not perfect. I mean, the, for instance, the, the Lakota Dakota warred with the Métis and previous to that, the Anishinaabe and the Cree for years battled over the, the bison. But the end of that conflict resulted in more commitment, not less. What I mean by that is at the end of that commitment, the choice was between the Lakota and Dakota and the Anishinaabe and the Cree is that the children who were lost on each side would have to send children to replace those children. Not that they'd give them away, but they'd have to do the work of that children. So if you need a berry picker, you send it over. If you needed a, um, a storyteller, you sent them over. If you if you needed a, a person to go hunting, you sent them over. If you needed a person to come and help and run this ceremony over here, you sent them over. And one of the most amazing things that happens, children, when they go over there, they get married to the other children. They 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 get to know other people. They begin to be the nieces and the nephews. And that's what creates Manitoba, an interdependence. That's what it looks like according to what Indigenous involvement is like in North America, uh, Turtle Island. But yet this is what we teach children. What we teach children and in universities for that matter is unitary concepts with very defined identities. But the bottom line of it is, is that Indigenous foundations of who we are encourage us to think in multiplicity, complex, and diverse ways. Like, in, it's Indigenous peoples who indig introduced multiculturalism. Europeans are all invested in unitary identities. And in fact, they're still, we might call Canada a multicultural state, but that's an absolute lie. We don't live multiculturally at all. We basically say English and French are the only ones that matter and indigenous languages or any other place, like they all come second, like go and line up at the trough. Hopefully you'll get a government grant, but English and French, we're going to make schools. We're going to make laws to protect them. We're going to make sure that every single aspect of the English French experience is protected for indigenous peoples. They have to go and line up with languages and cultures and communities that have come from thousands of miles away and have homelands that they can return to where those things are protected. Indigenous peoples have virtually no protections in this place whatsoever. And every time there is something recognized, like a treaty right, for example, you have to go all the way to the Supreme Court and spend billions of dollars in order to get that proven. So the, the problem is, is what we teach children, what we teach students, what we teach at the university is very unitary concepts where Indigenous peoples encourage us to think in diverse, complex ways. And this is going to be really important for us to think about because what it's going to tell us is that we have learned all the major things that we call Canadian, like those things where we say, oh, well, we're really proud of Canada because of, of multiculturalism or multilinguality or, uh, or that we live in a place with UN peacekeepers or the social welfare state or democracy. Who do you think introduced all of those ideas? Here's a hint. It's not Europe at all. Like, for instance, let's talk about governance for a second. If we had governance system based on Europeans, it would be like the king feudal system. 
power centrally located in one or two people or a family, and then that nepotistic family that declares what is the laws for everybody else. No, when we, you, you know, what is what was North America's big contribution to the world? Well, it's this idea that we would all get together and we'd vote a representative and we'd send them to a great meeting, and then that great meeting they would you know come to a decision together. Well, that is exactly the great league of, of nations, right? Or the great uh, the great law, as the Haudenosaunee described it, which is democracy. Uh, it is indigenous peoples who invented democracy. They have this, indigenous people have this radical idea that we're all supposed to come to some kind of agreement to live together and that everybody matters. Like uh, indigenous peoples have this crazy idea that we should feed the elders first or that we should take all of our medicines and put them in a pile or all of our resources and put them in a pile. Or when we beg a moose, we have to make sure everybody gets a little piece. That is not the European way of thinking. The European way of thinking is my kingdom, my rules, my uh, my laws and my borders are very independent, sovereign, and that therefore my nation state is only in con competition with other nation states. Imagine this for a moment. Um, now, indigenous, the way indigenous nations would talk about borders, for example, is they would often move borders uh, depending on what each nation would need, and they would offer tobacco and gifts. And Anishinaabe and Cree were always changing their borders here in Manitoba. What that meant was is that there's many people with Anishinaabe and Cree identities because they interrelate, intermarry, and so on. That's what the Forks is all about uh, down at the downtown. Is really that meeting place where people would grow and interconnect all the time. I want you to imagine that uh, Justin Trudeau phones up Joe Biden or Donald Trump or whoever is the U.S. president and says, "Hey, we're we're going to put the border this year." Like, where do you think Canada would be? I'm going to say Baffin Island, and the Inuit would be like, "You guys all going home soon?" Or like, "What's the deal?" Because Canada and the United States are not interdependent. Uh, regardless of what we want to say with trade and so on, what they are is they're in competition with one another. And uh, generally, as we saw, for instance, with the COVID-19 vaccines, that's it's going to take care of the United States. They don't care about Canada until much later to the point where it's profitable to care about Canada. And now suddenly they're selling vaccines over to us. It's a perfect example of what it looks like to be independent versus interdependent. Indigenous peoples are interdependent. And that might be something really important for us to think about in terms of the future. The problem, of course, is that since the very beginning and the premises of this country, it has always been about building an economy, a country, a, a set of, uh, of societies or a society built off the backs of Indigenous peoples. When the king said, everything is mine in 1763, this is exactly what he did. He said, you know, look at this map right here. Suddenly now everything is red. Everything under is under King George III. And then all the dominoes just fall from that. And everything has been about land and has been about declaring the land as vacant as, 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 uh, as indigenous peoples saying, we don't have civilizations, we don't have writing. And, and I'm not here to give you a history lesson on colonization, but generally it's been to ignore indigenous peoples, to not think about them. And much like we have been doing up until this point before territorial acknowledgements, when suddenly now we're recognizing that we share relationships with indigenous peoples, it's to act as though they aren't there or they're problems that we somehow have to solve. The, sol the solution is to convert them into us. And I, uh, us meaning Canadians, Christians, uh, so-called civilized people. The fact is that indigenous peoples were all of those things, still are all of those things. And we just have to look underneath the concrete or maybe in a mall to see what indigenous peoples are still showing us today. You know, these things that we have, these treaties that we have to between one another, these aren't just documents that create space. They're, they create family. They create an interdependent relationship. There's a reason why the treaty medals look like this, that they're about uh, sharing of gifts. They're about connection. They're about equality. They're about looking at one another and saying, how do we share this space together fully, absolutely, and completely. And let me tell you, it is nothing like the world that we see right now, where most of the land is stolen, indigenous peoples are hammered into poverty, hammered into terrible situations involving violence, over-policed. Um, that's not what it was supposed to look like. It was supposed to look like everyone sharing tobacco. This is what reconciliation is supposed to give us an opportunity to think about. And one of these guys in this picture is my father. So I'll let you figure out which one it is. But uh, my family's been at this thing for a very long period of time. In fact, my dad was the head of the TRC. And uh, now we have the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation at the University of Manitoba. So we are, interestingly enough, positioned 
to head up this reconciliation thing. Why? Because in many ways, we are the center of now what is the TRC process, the TRC offices, the Truth and Reconciliation offices, we're in Winnipeg, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. Like, why is that? Why are we so heavy in the reconciliation project um, when we've got all these challenges? And, you know, just name them. You know, McLean's Magazine sent a, coffee, sent a reporter here for a coffee break. And this coffee break that they spent a couple days here then came out and said, oh, well, this is the most racist city in the universe, which is the stupidest thing I ever heard. And they said, well, these are the problems of this community and all of this different list, as you can see here. Um, none of this is a Manitoba problem. None of this is an Indigenous problem. In fact, if anything, all of these are created by Canada's violent relationships with Indigenous peoples. But we see it more in Winnipeg, and there's a reason why. And there's probably the most important thing of all is that we see something else happening in Winnipeg. And I want to show it to you of what it looks like. From June 16th to 19th, 2010, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada held its first of seven national events at the Fork site in Winnipeg. The event started with a sunrise ceremony and the lighting of a sacred fire. For us, the spirit is the one who helps us and leads us, eh? So we, we don't ever forget that. So all the time before we do ceremonies or events like that, we have our ceremony before we do the work. So we ask for that guidance. Good morning. Bonjour. Morning pipe ceremonies were held that included survivors and representatives from the churches among the participants. It puts my spirit a little lighter, very light, really, because um, I've never experienced something like this before. I mean, usually we have our own ceremonies and, you know, we, within our, our own, but to have all these different people participating in this, it just feels good. Highlight, I think, is the fact is Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people met around a fire that represents healing and reconciliation. What you have when you're doing a pipe ceremony then is you have the whole universe looking in on you. To see all these people here, that, to know that, uh, you know, or of all, of all all of one mind, you know, everybody shared their tobacco and put their, their thoughts and their prayers into that tobacco. Wednesday's official opening ceremony set the stage for a four-day event that would include survivors and over 40,000 other Canadians. We have a chance while we're involved with the work of the Commission and while you are here to make history and to be part of history. I hope that the time will come in your lives when you can look back at this day and say that this was an important day in the way that things have evolved in this country. The healing is the hidden word in our TRC mandate. Healing is the purpose behind truth. It is the purpose behind reconciliation. As our mandate says so very powerfully, truth and reconciliation activities will promote the healing that will set our spirits free. Through this effort with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, through your strength to tell the story, to tell the truth, that this country will understand. And it's by understanding that we can begin to bridge those deep gaps of misunderstanding that have plagued us for so long that created deep conflict. And acts of reconciliation can take many forms. We will support and we encourage full participation with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We're encouraged that Canada is taking steps to endorse the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples recognizing our people and ask my late grandfather Saint to see us as indigenous nations. After the opening ceremonies, the survivors marched across the site to the first commissioner's sharing circle, where survivors were invited to speak and have the commissioners and other dignitaries bear witness. Thank you for, for taking time to listen tonight. I don't want to apologize for being here.
to make sure that we do everything we can to make sure that the record is complete, that we turn over every rock, that we make every every supreme effort to make sure that we get that kind of information and that we work together so that we can uh, that you can get some peace. Okay, did everybody see that? This is Chuck Stroll. He's the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. This is 2010. And just a moment previous to this, not only is it this incredible moment of, of people conversing, meeting, sharing with one another, but then this happens. A survivor shares her absolutely brutal story of struggling to have Canada understand the violence that is not just happening previously, but is currently happening in Indigenous communities. And the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, Chuck Stroll, who in those days was in the Stephen Harper government, has a moment where he realizes something. Maybe for the first time in his life, but he realizes the first time ever that he is a part of trauma and that he has inherited this trauma that may not be his fault, but is his inheritance, not just as the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, but as a Canadian. And that that is a realization that overwhelms him that is emotional and the most remarkable thing of all, which is that a survivor consoles him. An indigenous person consoles a non-indigenous person in the most kind and giving way possible and says, we will work through this together. Like, isn't that remarkable? Like, that's amazing. And where did it happen? In the same place where Pegwis adopts Selkirk in the same place where tobacco is shared, in the same place where today we can see ongoing incredible growth, like this incredible growth. You know, Indigenous peoples are the fastest growing population in the country. We're also the youngest. Uh, indigenous peoples are growing so fast. We're not the biggest population though. The biggest population is actually in Ontario and Quebec. Um, and even in BC, we're not the largest Indigenous population in the country. But the most amazing thing is, is that, you know, amongst Age-wise, non-Indigenous peoples are growing exponentially older, between the age of 35 and 49, that's in the blue. And on the red, Indigenous peoples are the youngest population, between 5 and 19. Proportionally, here in Manitoba, we are the largest segment of Indigenous peoples. Uh, this is back in 2006, so it's you know around 16%. We're closer to 20% now, and we are leading the country in the largest presence proportional population of Indigenous peoples anywhere. That tells you two really important things. Is One is that we see Indigenous peoples more in this place. Every single Manitoban works with, lives beside, or is married to an Indigenous person. That means that every single one of us has presence in our life. We cannot deny it. Whether you're even driving through communities like the North End or Point Douglas or St. Boniface or right here in my neighbourhood, uh, you are visiting with Indigenous peoples all the time permanently. That means you can't just ignore them. That means the second part, which is that we all must act accordingly. We all must see one another and then figure out a way to live together. In fact, if you cannot work effectively with an Indigenous person, you are unemployable in Manitoba because you create more problems for the rest of us. And we're seeing that right now amongst policing. We're seeing that amongst the business community. And we're seeing that amongst even people who say racist things in workplaces, online, like in schools, for example, teachers who simply create more problems for the rest of us and should not have a job. If you cannot work effectively with Indigenous peoples, you are unemployable in this place. And, and, and what I say to teachers is it's therefore your responsibility to create competent citizens, people who can work together, because in Manitoba, it's an inevitable reality. But the second truth is, is that everyone else is getting to where Manitoba is. So like look, for example, Toronto, right? And all the different red dots, it's just more diffuse. If you add them all up, they're actually bigger red dots than Manitoba. If you in Vancouver, bigger red dots, right? So what we're saying is, is what we're seeing in Winnipeg is kind of ground zero of reconciliation. 
And the, the ground zero is this, is that as the Canadian population retires, Indigenous peoples will be that opportunity that we have. And the column that I wrote the other day is about how we're making incredible inroads at the University of Manitoba, but current provincial legislation may undo all of that very quickly. You can read my column to hear me what I say about that. Here at the University of Manitoba, we've committed to that journey for many different incredible people along that path, Kaylee Storm being one of them, Carl Stone, who's in this picture, people who set the groundwork for years and decades decades of development that eventually culminated in Bigazi Agamic, the commitment that we've made to Indigenous education. And none of this is extra. This is dealing with the reality that we are in an Indigenous-led community and we always have been, we always will be. And that means that we invest in students. When we invest in students, then we also invest in people and education. And here's what we do uh, with Braden. So Braden Harper, for example, is one of our students. He goes forth and then begins to uh, work for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers eventually learn to do a territorial acknowledgement because football is about land theft. And if we're to teach people at the bomber games that land theft is not something we always want to do, but that we want to be able to think about how we are relatives before and after the whistle, uh, that's what we do a territorial acknowledgement. We see the people we share our territory with and we commit to sharing the land with them. We commit to a future relationship and a relationship of reconciliation into the future. Well, when Braden does this, then another team started to notice. And a team we'll call the Winnipeg Jets, alongside the Edmonton Oilers, the Jets called me and said, would you write our territorial acknowledgement? And I said, absolutely. And so I wrote the territorial acknowledgement the Winnipeg Jets used, and now they're saying it right near the national anthem. But it's not just that the Jets do that, but they also did this. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm Bell MTS Place welcome to the Strong Warrior Girls Anishinaabe Singers who will perform our national anthem in Ojibwe. I'll just cut it short there because, uh, uh, but notice how you have 15,000 people cheering uh, young Anishinaabe girls to sing in Ojibwe. And I don't really care what song it is. 15,000 Winnipeggers sailing, singing uh, or cheering on Ojibwe seems to be something pretty damn remarkable. But it's not just that the Jets did this. They've indigenized their logo. They've done things like honor the big drum. They've done this now three years in a row. And in many ways, you know, there's one thing that's uh, that's become very evident to me is that the Jets are committed to this mission and leading the NHL, even if the NHL doesn't want them to do it. In fact, when the Jets went to Saskatoon to uh, go and do a treat, go and do the Heritage Classic, uh, the NHL controls 100% of that game, by the way. And they said, we're not going to do the territorial acknowledgement. You know, what the Jets said, well, we won't play that. And that, that's what it's like to live in Winnipeg. That's what, it, that's what it's like to live in this place because we are a place built from tobacco. We are a place built in relationship. We are a place in which all of us consider life together. And we're not perfect, but do not believe the headlines that we are the most racist city in the galaxy. The stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life because yes, Saskatoon, Vancouver, Toronto, all have racism problems but we are ground zero for Canada's racism. But most importantly, we are ground zero for reconciliation because reconciliation lives here in everything that we do in my family and the fact that you've been spending an hour with me to talk about it. So I want to say a huge miigwech and thank you very much for your time. Uh, I really want to also appreciate and say a big miigwech and thank you to the, uh, uh, to, oh, let me see if I can pull this up again. A big miigwech and thank you to all of uh, all the people from the UM Alumni Association that were able to host this and bring me in to be able to speak to all of you. I know that's going to live onto YouTube. And uh, Tracy, I think you uh, you want to have some sort of a little bit of conversation or dialogue or yeah. questions or comments or I'm sure my mom is posting in the chat somewhere. <laughs> Which is wonderful. That's great. We're going to get to the questions. But before we do, I just wanted to mention also that, uh, Nigan, that um, 
many of our alumni have requested that they wanted to hear you speak. And I'm so glad that you're able to, to be part of this and uh, share that very, very powerful, uh, amazing presentation. So we have a lot of questions and comments. So let's just get right to it, I think. Um, if you want to bring it up on the screen so some there are some comments, or some lovely comments but also some questions so um okay so teddy if you want to maybe bring it down a bit because i think there's some ones further up so um okay so let's just start here okay so about your use of the word equality how would you compare your definition of that word with the definition of equity as used in the field of feminism yeah so um, I'm certainly no uh, expert on equality. I think equality most oftentimes think of everybody as equal, but that's not what Indigenous peoples mean by equality, because that would mean that we're all somehow homogenous or that we're all somehow the same. Equality is, is recognizing that people come from diverse backgrounds and have diverse interests. And also that when we come to a circle, it's, job, it's everyone's job to bring their gift, right? It's everyone's job to bring food to the feast. The only rule that we ever have about the feast is that you cannot show up empty handed meaning you must offer something, not just food though, time, your name, a funny story. You know, when we go, when we come to the feast, everyone's expected to do something, but we don't expect everyone to bring cheese. We don't expect everybody to have the same experience because we all have different taste buds. We don't have the exact expectation that everybody is going to recognize the food or the value of the food or pray in the same way. That's why we offer opportunities. And the thing that we say the most is, is that everyone is welcome here. Uh, we've just built a lodge at the Forks, which is called a wigwam, and this this lodge that we've, and one of the things that we've posted at that place, I'm the head of the curation at the Forks, and so we oversaw that project with a number of elders and knowledge keepers and leaders, and is that the direction of that space was that everyone would be welcome here, and that it wasn't just an Indigenous space, but it's a space for everyone to come together. It is, however, Indigenous-led which is the truth that I think many Canadians are not ready to face, which is that Indigenous peoples have built every single thing, every ounce, every step, every breath that we think of as fundamentally Canadian is built by Indigenous peoples. And therefore we owe them a tremendous uh, debt. We also owe them a tremendous responsibility to use these things in a good way and to recognize that multiculturalism, democracy, UN peacekeepers, all of those things that we think of as Canadians are Indigenous in their core. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots for us to be learning from that, right, to, to, to consider. So thank you for that. Um, Teddy, if you want to bring it back up, okay. So oh, um, uh, moved by your words that this place is ground zero for reconciliation. Thank you for this incredible presentation. Uh, next uh, question is, what are your thoughts on land acknowledgement, acknowledgements when organizations are still perpetuating harm against our peoples? Is the increase in land acknowledgements performative? Oh, absolutely. You know, I think I, I also, you know, like um, I, I did a thing this morning for Unifor, which was their, you know, international or their provincial conference or interprovincial conference or whatever it was, the Prairies Conference. Anyways. And, um, you know, I, I often say to people, you know, the, 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 the problems with territorial acknowledgements is when we start calling them land acknowledgements, because we're not really talking about responsibilities when we're saying the land. Like we can all acknowledge the land, like the land is beautiful. I think that's a good step. But when we talk about territory, we're talking about the relationships that beings share. And I'm not just talking about human beings. I'm also talking about the bear nation and the bird nation and the fish nations. Like I'm talking about the ways in which we share relationships with our non-human relatives as well. That's when we start talking about territory. Like a bear, for example, will recognize other people's territory. They'll mark a tree. And that doesn't mean you can't come in their territory, but you better act respectful. And so... That's what I mean when I say a territorial acknowledgement, which is that you have to act and not just say it. Like that's what the animals relatives have taught us. That's what also, you know, any um, any relationship where people share space. Let's think of a roommates, for example. You, you could acknowledge each other all day, but if one person's abusive to the others, then what's the point of ever acknowledging each other? In fact, you're not really acknowledging everything you've said has just been undermined by the fact the abuse exists within the household. So. The key here is understanding that territorial acknowledgements are two things, seeing people who you share the territory with, but then acting differently, acting accordingly to the words that you share. So for example, if you're a company that says, oh, I'm gonna make a territorial acknowledgement for every meeting, but then you go out and you do projects that ignore indigenous peoples, refuse to consult with them, follow colonial policies that are about stealing land and, and continuing the theft of that land. And frankly, 
this is the I'm basically describing Manitoba Hydro to you. And and until very recently, Manitoba Hydro has acted incredibly violently, probably the most genocidal crown corporation in Manitoba history. And the bottom line of it is, is that if if you continue to act, I don't really want you to make a territorial acknowledgement because it's pointless because you continue to act violently. I'm glad you made that difference that that told us that difference. I didn't realize that. So thank you for that. I will I will only call it a territorial acknowledgement going forward. So thank you for, the, for those words. It's, you know what? These are nitpicky things. But just it, when we use the term territorial acknowledgement, we really understand the politics of it. And I'm not talking about human politics. I'm talking about non-human politics. I'm far more interested in, in our relationship with the bears than I am with non-Indigenous peoples or Indigenous and non -Indigenous, Because frankly, we could all be get along great, but it, it doesn't matter if we got nothing to eat. And we got no air to breathe. Like, I don't actually care about indigenous and non-indigenous relationships as I care very deeply about, are we going to have like safe water to drink in the next 50 years? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Teddy, if you want to bring some more, there's more questions. Um, what advice would you give to indigenous peoples working for the federal and provincial governments in terms of bringing their community with them? Yeah, it's it's a tricky situation, and and I'll describe it like this: like, um, so I'm very good friends with Indigenous politicians, and we can all probably imagine who that is. Uh, most of them are my age; they're very good friends of mine. We all hung out at some point or another, and now they're MPs or MLAs or something like that. If you are an Indigenous person in Canadian governments or provincial governments, you do not represent Indigenous peoples. You may try to, and you may in some way succeed. Like Kevin Chief, for example, I'll pick on Kevin because he's one of my best friends. And so uh, Kevin, when Kevin is in provincial governments, he's not representing Indigenous peoples. He may try to, and he may succeed in lots of different ways. But you represent Canadian political interests when you represent Canadian parties, meaning that Indigenous peoples will usually lose in that scenario. Um, usually Canadian policy, the, the policy of the Crown, will, will trump above all else. And I'm using that term intentionally, trump. You know, we'll, we'll just erase Indigenous peoples from the map. Um, and so that's usually what happens in Canadian in, when people work for the government, is that you are being asked to support policies that most often erase Indigenous peoples. However, that doesn't mean that you don't have power because you have tremendous power because you work for the federal government. That means that you can have conversations, you can enact policy, you can challenge policy as well, resist it. Because I can tell you that, you know, uh, it's all fine and good when everyone's getting along, but when we disagree, that's where the true test of ethics and responsibilities lie. Because like, you know, the true test of a family is not when you're getting along, like that doesn't make, you know, who cares when you're getting along, you're all getting along, like you all love each other. But like when you disagree and it's like a serious disagreement, do you stay in the room? And for those of you working in, the, in governments, you know, whether an MP or an MLA or a deputy minister or, you know, a person who's working at a desk, you know, you have an opportunity. And do you bring your ethics to that moment? Do you remember where you come from? Remember my auntie that gave me that ax and said, you know, like, don't forget you are a nephew. I don't care how many letters you have behind your name or how many times you're on TV or how many times, you know, people give you whatever or call you Dr. Sinclair. Like, like, remember, you're a nephew. And honestly, being a nephew is what makes my work 100 times better as a doctor or as a person on TV or as a writer. Yeah, exactly. Wonderful words. Um, Teddy, if you want to bring some more questions. Um, thank you for sharing your wisdom. What can old white guys like me who want to do something do? I want to act as you suggest. Any suggestions? Uh, well, uh, I can tell you that uh, I, I both love and hate this question, and here's why, is because um, I really hate when people say things like, well, I'm a white person, so uh, I'm not, you know, or I'm somehow feeling distant to what you said, or, or whatever, that kind of, like when people start say, talking about race here, like I work very hard to talk about us together, and there's a reason why I started today by telling you about my non-Indigenous relatives. I didn't do that un unconsciously. I did that because I'm trying to show you that Old white guys are my uncles, and I love them with all my heart. But sometimes one of them will say to me, you people protest and complain all the time when they see it on TV, and they're full of the same kind of Canadian ignorance involving Indigenous issues that, frankly, everybody who, uh, if you're a non-Indigenous person, you have to work really hard not to be ignorant. 
because you're conditioned to think so. You're conditioned to think of the world like the maps that I showed previous. You're taught to be ignorant. And so, so when my uncle says to me, you people protest and complain all the time, the first thing I say to him is I say, I love you, uncle. And second is there's no you people here. There's only your people. I am your people. We are people. Our people are right here in this place. And I love you with all of my heart. And so we got to figure this out. And so what I mean is, is that for the for the for our brother who is uh, talking, um, talking about being an old white guy, um, you have opportunities that I will never have. Here's one opportunity: you will be able to talk to people who would never hear this presentation, who would never meet me, who are saying things like, "Oh, that Negan Sinclair, he's an idiot." And here you are in a Tim Hortons one day, and uh, you hear somebody say that, and you can go, "Well, what is it that you think he's an idiot about, or what is it that you think?" Uh, you know, this is this issue that you have a very strong opinion on, but you haven't done a lot of reading on. Or, hey, you know, Capion Barracks is the greatest idea in this province's history. It's going to be the greatest investment anyone has ever seen. And it cost non-Indigenous peoples almost nothing. Do you know what it cost non-Indigenous peoples? $45 million for the federal government to fight a battle they were going to lose anyways. $45 million of taxpayer money wasted fighting useless piece, useless battles on what was the right thing to do, which was at the end of the day, give that to Treaty One First Nations, who aren't going to create a, you know, some sort of rehab clinic, which is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. They're probably going to create an hotel, maybe like a, a hockey rink, which is what the plans are, and then you know a, a green space that all Winnipeggers are going to love. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the most remarkable place in Winnipeg history. And it's because non-Indigenous peoples live here, will always live here, want to make this place amazing for everybody, just like we always have. And so when you're in that Tim Hortons and you hear that and people say, oh, that Cap Young Barracks is what a stupid thing we're giving free up to Indians. And you say, well, then your work begins. And I say, that's amazing that you can do that work. I, they'll never talk to me. And they'll never sit and hear this message from me. They will listen to it from you. Yeah, thank you for that. That's that's great advice and exactly empowering, you know, empowering us that we we people who are non-indigenous to it's how you stop people in their tracks by saying things that are ignorant uh, and racist and inappropriate. So that's uh, that that's, that's and also I mean don't forget you know like when we do uh, when we do gatherings right I don't care if it's Manitowapi powwow or when we have a march on Main Street uh, or whatever like we don't have a big sign going Native people only. <laughs> <laughs> like when Tina Fontaine yeah. was killed, uh, I saw 4,000 Winnipeggers come out. It was the very first time in my entire life I saw non-Indigenous peoples being at least 50% of the crowd. 4,000 Winnipeggers came out that night. It's because Winnipeggers saw Tina as their daughter too. And that was that's a, that's a moment you see nowhere else. It never happens in Toronto. It never happens in Vancouver. It happens in Winnipeg. Also, Saskatoon, Thunder Bay, these places we are often thought of as problems in the country, they are the places leading reconciliation and everyone else should look to Winnipeg, Saskatoon, Thunder Bay, Regina, Edmonton a little bit. Like these are places that reconciliation live and Canada might be better served to learn instead of sending a reporter to call us racist, which is, you know, totally stupid and doesn't help the conversation at all. Right, absolutely. Yeah, you're right. Um, maybe we'll go through maybe two more questions before we, we close. Um, so I think we I think we we probably addressed the first one is how can non-indigenous peoples participate meaningfully in reconciliation? You you've described that already. Um, thanks to your ability to communicate interculturally, I've been reading more and more about the colonial still alive and well here. I don't think there's really a question there, but the next one, what are your thoughts on some academic arguments that the existence of intertribal warfare justifies colonization and the loss of traditions as natural? Yeah, well, I mean, I, this is sometimes I hear this from people who used use terms like uh, evolution and the wars were fought and there were, you know, they, there's winners and losers and, you know, the people who write the history books are the winners kind of thing. Um, there's nothing natural about the Indian Act. Like the only parallel to the Indian Act, uh, which was the document that eventually created residential schools, controlled Indigenous peoples on communities, was used as, as a method 
to undermine anything that was agreed upon in the treaties. So while the Canada was negotiating the treaties, promising to share the land wholeheartedly, they were also planning the Indian Act, which meant that the treaties, what everything Canada said, everything Canadians said at that time of negotiation was a bunch of lies. And I don't know if you feel comfortable being built on a bunch of lies, but I know that I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to know that my ancestors were thieves and were terrible liars who made sure that Indigenous peoples got the short end of the stick. Like, I don't know if that makes something to you, but it certainly means something to me. I would want to do something to rectify that in some way, because it would seem to me like, for instance, if, if I went over, if I did my neighbor, right? And I went in and I punched my neighbor in the face and I stole all of his stuff. And then, uh, and then I gave it all to my children. And then, you know, my children did this beautiful house and had this beautiful riches. And my neighbor lived in squalor and poverty and pain. And then, you know, 10 generations later, uh, they're still continue to do so. And then I found out how I got to be in the position that I'm in, which was all through violence and genocide. I would think that I would want to do something about it. And I would feel... I wouldn't feel bad. I would want to do something tomorrow. I would say I have a responsibility to be a good person. And if I continue to, if I continue the violence, then I don't have a right to call myself a good person. So therefore I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to go to the March. I'm going to contribute uh, in whatever way. It doesn't have to be financial. It could be, I contribute my time and energy to reading and thinking. I'm going to support people who are engaged in the process of helping uh, this, you know, poverty deal with in Winnipeg, which is an overwhelming indigenous uh, you know, on the, on the Indigenous side, or murder, missing Indigenous women and girls, or the overabundance of children in the child welfare system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to do my part to try to rectify these violences and genocide, which has been the premise of why I have the house that I'm living in, of why I have these streets that I can drive upon, why I can go to the mall and buy anything that I want. It That is because of the violence that has happened that has led you to that place. It's not meant to pra paralyze you, but that's meant to say that we're all in this together. So when I speak about things in terms of an intercultural way, what I'm really talking about is going, we're all in this together and I've inherited it too. You know, I'm a part of this as much as you. So I want my children and your children to get together and I want them to get married. I want them to make a beautiful life. I want them to be different than what I had inherited, which was, you know, in the 1980s, tremendous racism, 1990s, uh, you know, people began to wake up for the first time. And then finally in 2010, we danced in a mall together. That's remarkable. Mm -hmm. Like that's remarkable. And we're doing it faster here in, in Manitoba, in Winnipeg. And we, we can show the country what it looks like. You know, there's something interesting that Christine Sear, our new uh, Associate Vice President uh, Indigenous Relations, and she said something that was really, I found very moving and I hadn't thought about it, but she said when she was talking about the circle of courage and she talked about belonging and relationships and she said, we're all related. And and that I, 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 I that had never resonated with me before. So it was very interesting and sort of what you're saying in terms of that, that relationship, we're all in this together, we're all part of it, we're all related. Uh, uh, in some ways, so it's it's, uh, it's very moving. So we have one last question, and then we'll we'll conclude. Um, and that is actually they're asking about your time in Oklahoma uh, when you were uh, when you were a student. Uh, I yeah. believe it is the U.S. state with the largest percentage of Indigenous population. Yeah, I, and, I don't know. I'm sure. And you do you know, know why it's the largest state of the Indigenous population? Is because uh, because people were forced to go there because they were kicked off their lands in places oh. like Georgia in the Carolinas, and even as far north as Minnesota, people were forced to walk there by gunpoint by the U.S. Cavalry to go to Oklahoma. And, uh, you know, when it, the University of Oklahoma that I went to, their, 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 their logo is called the Sooners, right? So the University of Oklahoma Sooners, right? they're one of the biggest football programs in the country. And they're constantly in the top five or top six or whatever. Anyways, but the reason they're called the Sooners is because the rule was is that if you could get to if you could get to Oklahoma before the Indians got there, when the cavalry forced them off their land and they were walking to Oklahoma, if you got there sooner than the Indians, then the Indians could not could not inhabit the land in which you were then settled upon, and you had to have what you know land rights, meaning that you had to, uh, occupancy rights, and so you, every time Oklahoma scores a football touchdown, uh, they send the sooner we wagon onto the field to replay the genocide to replay the stealing of indigenous land and you can watch it in a football game every single sunday it's like 
Oh, Saturday, actually. They play games on Saturday. But you can actually watch it. It's really remarkable. And so that tells you a lot about um, both that Indigenous peoples are full in you know, Oklahoma, but there's lots of different Indigenous nations, like the most complex and, and eclectic group of Indigenous peoples. On one side, you have very strong Indigenous Christians. Another side, you have very strong traditional people like green corn ceremonies, the Creek people. You know, there's lots of different Indigenous nations in Oklahoma, a really rich dynamic experiences. But then you also have some of the most profound racism in the world involving Indigenous peoples in Oklahoma. And, you know, like... Uh, like, uh, you know, we talk about sports logos and wearing headdresses at hockey games and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Like the United States, uh, particularly in, you know, the, the the fervent demands to keep the name Redskins and Cleveland Indians, like only those things are changing because of Black Lives Matter, because yeah. there's an awareness of race for probably one of the first times in history mm -hmm. in the United States. And but like, you know, that kind of profound racism is just the, the rule of the day across the southern United States, especially involving Indigenous peoples. We hear a lot about Black racism, uh, but we don't hear a lot about Indigenous racism, but it is heavy in places like Oklahoma. Yeah, and I think, like, is it the Fighting Sioux in North Dakota or something like that? I mean... Yeah, they're yeah. no longer called that because the NCAA yeah. refused to let them play like that any longer. Oh, like, so that they're, I think they're called something, and there's something to do with the bird or something now, but, but like... Okay. You know, like, so things are shifting, mm -hmm. but it's because of love, kindness, and generosity. And, and like, when you watch that round dance in the mall, when I started today, notice that indigenous peoples, like, regardless of the violence, continue to offer peace, kindness, generosity, tobacco, gift song. These are remarkable. Isn't that remarkable? It is remarkable. I'm so glad you showed that video and, and a nice way to end this as that's a lot. We can all learn a lot from that. So Thank you so much, uh, and again, for that really powerful, meaningful presentation. I hope every, all of our viewers took a lot from that and a lot of even steps as to what they can do in terms of all of us supporting uh, and, and making sure that reconciliation happens within our city and within our province and within this country. Uh, so so I thank you everybody for taking the time to be here. You, This will be posted on our website. You'll be able to watch it again. Please share it with others. I really encourage you to do that as there's lots to learn here and to think about. Please do more reading uh, on, there's a, a number of things that Dr. Sinclair uh, shared with us. There's a lot in terms of getting to be more knowledgeable about this and where and where all of our roles are in supporting uh, and uh, reconciliation. Uh, you will be receiving a, a survey as per usual, um, just to provide some feedback as it's the only way we're able to learn. from week to week in terms of topics that you'd be interested to hear about and just about the program in general. And if you have registered for next week's session, I encourage you to do so. Next week will be Dr. Sohela Parima, who will be speaking on research advances in pathogenesis and therapeutic development for multiple sclerosis. So I encourage you to go on our website and register for that if you haven't yet. So thank you everybody for participating and have a wonderful day.